partner from Brazil. My heart is in Brazil, so he's representing the, my heart. Um, and uh, so he couldn't come yesterday because he's also participating with the Brazilian team at the, the Olympia. So today he came running from a meeting they are having at the Olympia. He's going to talk and then run away back to the Not Olympia. Running away. Not running away. No. <laughs> so Gustavo, thank you very much for coming and representing us. I must say that Brazil
uh, after class, like the extracurricular activity. Uh, there are some kids that they have computer. I mean, nowadays everybody has computer. You know? So sometimes when the first sessions they do in the school with the, the teacher, but after that, like two or three times a week, they know what they have to do. They do at their home. Too. So it's more flexible. More questions? Okay, thank you very much, Gustavo. You know, for me, I'm Brazilian. You all know that already. But uh, I always had this mixed feeling growing up that uh, you shouldn't leave your country. I didn't leave Brazil because I didn't like to be there. I just left because I was married to a Portuguese, so I went to live in Portugal. But I realized that I could do more for my country away than being there. But they, they, they give me grief all the time. They are running workshops. They invite me via Skype. I am talking to all the teachers and all the time. Oh, I want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much, Gustavo. And it will be really great to have you with us uh, next year. All the team. Yeah, thank you great. very much. I, I'll be <laughs> OK, so now again. We have with us, uh, let's, say, let's see if I can pronounce his name correctly, which I have, haven't been doing for a long time. So, Babak. <laughs> Babak Tampreshi, uh, the leader of the project The World at Night, uh, will be talking about, uh, will be dazzling us with this project. So, Babak, the floor is yours. Second picture, we need to switch on. So that's okay. The lights off? Yes. The lights off. Well, Six moving because it takes time. I have to talk to someone who has to call someone. Uh -huh. who to call <laughs> so we have a program called <laughs> World at Night or Twan. It's, uh, it's a program of taking pictures of night the sky above the planet, either natural or historic attractions. And we are trying to connect people uh, using art and culture in these images. As well, the Tuan is not only about astronomy, we are also showing the world in a new light at night. You know, the world heritage areas are pictured by Tuan photographers. And we are trying to uh, also show the connection that different civilizations have under one sky. So that's why we are sharing the same slogan. We are organization astronomers without borders, which is one people, one sky. We will learn through the presentation what other messages these imagery audience, and um, they are mainly by photographers who are dedicated. Professionally living from selling images to media like National Geographic or publishers. But as a team in Tuan, we are doing this project non profit. So uh, many of the images are used by astronomers or science popularizers. 
for lectures and planetarium shows we have cost, but uh, these images are a uh, big cost for publishers and media uh, to make living for photographers. So some of our photographers are science journalists or uh, astronomy communicators, some are professional astronomers, but part of their life is dedicated to night sky photography. So let's start with this picture, which is taken by my colleague in Colorado in a small town during the Perseid meteor shock, which is going to happen in a few nights. In fact, on the morning of August 12, you're going to see this meteor shower on um, the highest activity. But in order to get the sense of feeling of the night, let's hear the sound captured, recorded by my colleague at the same time. No, I really need it to be dark. <laughs> So astronomy, for some people who are doing this sky in this society, is also a lot of adventure, and you get the sense of nature out at night. And I have this Persian proverb that I'd like to share. Night hides a world, but reveals a universe. And it's really true when, when you experience this with your own eyes under a starry sky and explode. My feeling is like exploring a cave, an unseen mountain, going to the top of the mountains and seeing the vista that only few people have experienced. And then you like to share it with the others. And one way of sharing it is by the means of photography and taking pictures of night and landscape in the foreground. Something like this, which is made from um, an island in Brazil called Ilha Grande. It's not far from Rio, but as the island is mostly preserved, we no, see. No, no problem. But you know, unfortunately, for two thirds of the population today, this is gone. This is gone to over five billion people today because light pollution. And as you all know, light pollution is not the light we need, it's the extra light that we're just scattering to the sky and wasting energy by this way. And uh, the 5 billion people is really a big portion of our population. Many people are living in suburb areas that are far still from the cities, but the light domes are just hovering all the sky, so you, you don't see the Milky Way. Pollution, light pollution is somewhere where the Milky Way is not visible, and that means two thirds of human population today. And it's not only about the beauty of night sky, um, there are many other connections that um, push us forward to preserve this heritage because of the wildlife that needs natural dark sky, a natural dark environment that night, human as well needs that. and. Uh, by separating ourselves from this part of the nature, we are separating from a big part of science as well. Interesting is that astronomy, from this perspective, from a Tuan imagery, is um, becoming a social phenomenon, becoming a culture as well as other speakers also mentioned. Because night sky is not only a laboratory for astronomers, of course it is a laboratory for all of you, but in a bigger um, definition, night sky is just part of our nature. We, it's half of our environment at night time. And if you approach this to public from this perspective, it's easier to preserve dark skies rather than insisting on this as a laboratory to explore the universe. That's important, but it's not enough to preserve it. Here is another very recent view from uh, Wyoming in the United States. 
It's called Grand Tetons National Park in a very dark area. But the moonlight is, has illuminated the landscape on the other horizon. The moon is rising. And some of these images might be quite peaceful. Of course, it is a peaceful location, but it's a paradise for people who are visiting and birds who are living there. So when you're visiting these areas, nighttime to take pictures, you very often deal with adventures. Nepal at Himalayas, where mountains are reaching over 8,000 meters, like this one, let's say, at the left is over 8,000. And the moonlight is again illuminating the landscape. Here, we have another source for illumination because you can see the rocks are illuminated and there is even shadow visible. So what is the source of light in this picture? The galactic bulge, the central bright area of the Milky Way is illuminating in Sagittarius and Scorpius, the whole landscape. And because the camera is very sensitive, it can even hit this very faint illumination and show us the shadow. It's captured in the southern coast of Australia. Another example now in Austria, I'm going to show you a series of images that shows how night sky nature is merged at night. We don't see any border between them if we consider night sky as part of our nature in the Alps, southern Austria. Now we are in Iran, in northern Iran, where towards mountains are located. And Orion, the hunter, is rising above the mountains. Now we are in Sahara, Algeria, at Tassili National Park. Or in Hawaii, where this active caldera is located. And you can see some of the southern stars from this northern hemisphere location including the Southern Cross on the right side here, and Alpha and Beta Centauri. They travel in Utah during this stormy night. Lightning? Yes, lightning, very strong lightning, and then uh, some of the northern stars, including Polaris up, up here. And seasonal views, like night sky in the springtime where Big Deeper or Sun Major is quite high in the sky in the northern hemisphere. A uh, garden in one of the villages in Abbas Mountains of Iran. Now we are in the United States. You can see between each villages we sometimes travel thousands of miles across the planet uh, and in the sky. Now we are in Yosemite National Park where some of the trees on the planet living up to and Mount Everest. Or Capella rising above Everest. A highway, a famous highway in uh, New England located in New Hampshire during the fall season. So what I'd like to also emphasize that images might be nice in artistic uh, framing, but what is also important for us is uh, that give some aspects of astronomy education in the picture. So the constellations are always well planned to be completed the view, or some celestial phenomena is going on in some of these pictures planned already by the photographer in advance. And uh, from this perspective, as I mentioned, night sky is part of our nature. The familiar context of two images, like a house, a tree, um, a lake, or very famous landmark, historic landmark, helps us to connect with people. Because when you isolate the night sky, people get a bit disconnected with them uh, compared to their daily life. But when you put something of the daily life in the picture, a night sky above in a real single photo, then they see, oh, OK, I, I know this part of my life. I know this part of nature. Because there is a mountain below, like this picture from the Dolomites in Italy. Many millions of people have traveled to Dolomites, but few have experienced 
the story is quite boring because most of them are sleeping in that time. Or here in Algors, again, northern Iran. Uh, interesting about this picture is several sorts of illumination that are acting, like the road down here illuminating the rocks in red, then the moon illuminating everything in the higher altitudes, and uh, of course, light pollution of the nearby city. Or millions of people have probably visited uh, Old Faithful Geyser in Yellowstone National Park of the US. But this picture is trying to show it in new lights in the night. Every two hours, the geyser is erupting. And here you can see the celestial bear just above it. Some other educational aspect of Tuan images, like comparing these two pictures, both of them are taken from latitude 36 degrees, but one 36 south, the other 36 north in Iran and Tasmania, Australia. So you can compare how a single constellation prominent the stars of Orion look like from two different hemispheres. So Orion is completely upside down in this one. Or comparing the southern sky and northern sky, and uh, as you can see, northern sky is showing some prominent bright stars, while in the southern sky, beauty belongs to the Milky Way as the center of the galaxy comes overhead. And there we also have these two little clouds known as the Magellanic clouds or neighboring galaxies. Or comparing the view of one single location at moonlight and in a moonless night. Or even one location in a moonless night within two hours difference. You can see the color of the sky background is completely changed from pale red to pale green. And that's because of air glow activity of the uh, emission of the Earth's upper atmosphere about 100 kilometers above us. Uh, and um, that, that is causing mainly red and green air glow. It's very faint. We can't see the color with our own eyes. But we can see some banded structure with tiny eyes. Some, uh, Artistic points of view within some of the font photographers like Laurent Lavazer from Brittany of France. He's always playing with the moon. Now, moon for the dinner or moon games. Sometimes we play with the titles to make images that shows scientific, sophisticated scientific equipment in, in a more a romantic way or a softer way to connect to people like Alma Observatory, uh, and I describe them as flowers of fondness. They're just uh -huh. collecting a starlight, like some flowers. Nice. They're all on the website? Yes. And the story, the authors are all there? Yes. Fantastic. So comparing these two pictures and showing another uh, approach of Tuan, we're trying to um, emphasize on the problem of light pollution. These two pictures are made with the same field of view, same orientation, but only 40 miles away, 60 kilometers, one inside Tehran, capital of 13 million people, and the other is in Nashville, night inside above Albers now. So this is what we are losing inside the city, and uh, I just call this Gone with the Light, for the famous American film, Gone with the Beam. Here in Dubai, it's already gone, unfortunately. Wow. The city has not much population, but so many guys. And of course, this prominent tower, over 800 meters. But comparing these two pictures is quite uh, shocking. You know, inside the city and then in the national night of the sky. Astronomy is an also an open free laboratory to all people. And that gives uh, another perspective of this science, which is very interesting to me. Because the laboratory for astronomers, for any people interested to night sky, is free and available to anyone. And that, of course,
for its help so promoting amateur astronomy in the world. Uh, I have a calculation of how many amateur astronomers we probably have in the world. It's about one million based on the clouds. So that, that's a big number. And this is one of those activities, stargazing, um, during a competition of Messier Marathon in Iran. Now compare the images of Tuan and the images taken from a space station, both looking at the same phenomena, stars and aurora borealis, but from two different perspectives, now we are in Norway. Now back on the station, 400 kilometers above the ground, you can see Orion and Sirius are appearing in the picture. And then we are now diving back to the planet, to a desert in central Iran, where Venus and Jupiter are setting in a full moon night. So another part is picturing the world's landmarks. We are taking pictures of many of the world's heritage. We try to be a bridge between art, humanity, and science. And uh, with this message of we all share the same sky, and either uh, a church, a Buddhist temple, a mosque, they're all under one roof. And under this roof, we are just one family. Uh, this is pictured by these four images when the moon is rising above Taj Mahal in India. Within a few hours, we, the same, uh, we see the same view in Persepolis of Iran. A few hours later, the same view would be appreciated by people in Greece, uh, over Cape Sunyan, not far from Athens. And then some hours later, across the Atlantic Ocean, this view will be seen by people in Arizona. So these images taken at important historic sites connect us also with the history of the universe and history of our universe, civilizations. Like this place, an iconic monument in southern Iran, the tomb of Cyrus the Great, 2,500 years ago. Jupiter is the bright source on the upper left. Or in Egypt, and Comet McNaught in the Easter Island back in 2007. Even before Tuan was born in 2007, uh, actually photographers were doing this for a long time. Like uh, These pictures have been made during the appearance of Comet Hellbob in 97 from different locations in the US and Egypt and over there in the Stonehenge of the UK. Now we are in China. Full moon night, great wall. Or here in the city of Yaz in central Iran during twilight. And now in Vienna. The sequence of photos has captured the setting moon over the historic part of Vienna, which is uh, another world heritage area. Now we are in Paris. A single photo captured by a telephoto lens from nearly two kilometers away, based on planning on when and from where this scene would be possible to capture. Can you recognize some stars on the upper right? 
So these are actually the top of the towers in the modern part of Paris. Look like the stars. Ah, ah. So the, the view, of course, is just overlooking Champs Elysees. And now we are in Maine, northern Maine, where this historic uh, lighthouse is located. On the other side, you see planet Venus and the zodiacal light. Green, pale green in the horizon is uh, related to variable activity. Much more back in the history, these petroglyphs are in the central part of Iran. Some of them are back from 17,000 years old. So, like uh, some of these animals were completely extinct at this area after the Ice Age. Or here this Greek style temple, but located in uh, Turkey today. So the adventure of astrophotography in this study is related to going to locations and doing nighttime challenges. Uh, many local people are not familiar with what you're doing, so that's a big challenge, like with security, police, and uh, local people who suddenly find you with a red light coming out of the head and two tripods in hand in the middle of nowhere. So you, you need to be ready for many of these things. While for a deep sky photographer, there are other challenges dealing with uh, sophisticated, larger equipment. Equipment here is very light, easy to pour, uh, to take around, but um, there are challenges dealing with temperature, for example, when the temperature drops dramatically at night, or going to locations to see what you're aiming for, like the northern lights uh, in very high latitude. Areas. So they present beauty of night and sky as seen with the naked eye. That's the main goal. They connect people to astronomy in, in a nice way, uh, which also involve art. They're unique based on locations and condition because uh, very often you can't repeat the same scenery because it involves some foreground that might change during the time and also the same thing wouldn't repeat exactly like this in the sky. So they usually have much less layers of processing as well, so we are looking for uh, naturally looking uh, images, but we don't process them that much. And of course they lack serious scientific data, we don't look for discoveries in these images, they might happen time to time, but this is not the purpose of a photographer. And they are showing very wide field of views uh, to resemble what we can see with the naked eye. Like this picture showing what we can see of constellation Orion and Sirius rising above moonlit landscape. But this dot over here is the Orion nebula, and the whole field of view of the telescope would be what you're seeing on the right side, less than one degree. More examples of the field of views we're dealing with. Uh, the 24 millimeter wide angle lens can capture several constellations, while with a telephoto of 200, you only see this part of constellation tower is full. And let's zoom in to this part of the sky. This is uh, very few locations, unfortunately, in Europe. It's left today with natural looking dark sky. And one area is the Alps, of course. So we are zooming on the right side of the picture, over here, where bright star Antares is located. So now we are just a bit beyond the visibility of the planets. So uh, just near Antares, you can see a strange star. It's actually a, a, a large blue blood cluster of over 100,000 stars, which is now visible in this deep sky picture. Phone photographers are also capturing the sky in motion. They can either make these photo sequences for a star trail, like in the picture in the right, the stacked images, um, layer by layer to create a long exposure star trail, or they can make a time lapse video of the celestial motion. More example, this one by my colleague Juan Chun from Korea is quite stunning. It's captured from Tanzania, 
at the foot of Kilimanjaro, and you will see a lot of things happening not only in the sky, also on the ground. Airglow is active, it's saturated in processing your you can see it better. So red, purple, and green airglow, and then this blue color elongated light is uh, zodiacal light, planets are setting, coma cluster is on the right side. And now mountaineers are getting ready to go to the peak before sunrise, they'd like to be there. But as they go <laughs> up, some of them get altitude sickness. So you can see some come down in the middle uh, at an altitude of about 4,000 meters. It's very common to get uh, sickness. But they were not aware that somebody is just capturing their failure. So it comes the first altitude sickness problem. And the center, the central part of the Milky Way is coming down. You can even pick some geostationary satellites in the picture, but not from far away. Uh, several meteors, and within a few seconds, we can see how morning twilight is changing the color of the background of the sky. So it's quite some work to do these time lapse videos because you need to manually change the transitions very often. Another multi uh, exposure image from Rio in Brazil captured the moon set um, over the famous part of the, uh, the city with these two brothers' mountains. The single image, which is a part of the sequence, so I'm going to compare these two for you. Uh, it's a tower in Tehran, a communication tower like 400 meters high, uh, with a telephoto lens from a very good location that they were relying. But here is the sequence. So when we stack them all together, you have a moon thread wow. instead of a star thread. There are many other smaller projects that Tehran photographers are doing, like in this part of the sky, you don't see uh, many nebulosity other than Orion nebula over here. This is the only nebula in the whole part of the sky in the winter constellation visible to unaided eyes. But what if we have a narrow band filter just filtering all the light pollution and going very deep with long exposures using a CCD camera? and then making a large mosaic of everything available in the background of the sky, this would be the result. Made by two of my colleagues at the Science Dose magazine, which is also one of them is a fond member. So it's a six month project to capture all the nebulosity in this area in Echalco Narrow Band. Wow. So Tuan Adventures, um, going to locations and very often dealing with very hard conditions, but you, you enjoy, of course, your time under a starry sky. This is another adventure that my friend Kim from Sweden is dealing with. He has two kids, his neighbor has not two kids, and time to time he needs to take care of four of them. And suddenly the sky of Sweden becomes clear, so he needs to take four kids during professional photography, and that's really tough. Going to locations with history like this caravanserai on a silk road, on the silk road in Iran. And in daytime we meet with locals. So I'm going to jump to the last part. Or we can't really extend the five minutes. Five minutes, because there's people on the other side of the line. Yeah. But the five minutes so let's review some of the most notable celestial phenomena that we are going to we are going, trying to re present in Tuan, like comets. Uh, this is a small comet over here, comet Anastars. It wasn't a great comet, but the, the image captured during um, early appearance of the comet in the northern hemisphere with the crescent moon completely deformed at the horizon, distorted by the atmospheric refraction over William Herschel telescope in La Palma, greater comet in 2007. We all look forward to comet Ison. Of course, there are many uncertainties at the moment about it, but in November, December, we might see something like this in the northern hemisphere. Meteor showers, like Perseids over 
uh, this old heritage site in Armenia, or these composite images, the image of many shots captured during the whole night showing the gradient of the shower, uh, showering constellation Persos, and super meteors called fireballs or bolides, like this one at magnitude minus 15. And what happens after such a bright meteor appears in the sky? You will very often capture the persistent meteor train. It's the ionized gas in the atmosphere after the uh, meteoroid passed through the atmosphere. And wow. It's just expanding in, in the sky. So this image is showing what happens nearly 40 minutes after uh, the fireball appeared in the sky. Solar eclipses, like this one, a partial eclipse in, in India. Nobody is attentioning. It seems one is running away. <laughs> <laughs> but most interesting of all these is, of course, a total solar This one from the middle of the ocean at the same time with a telephoto lens that you will be this. The next total solar eclipse is in November in Africa. Conjunctions of planets, Venus and Jupiter over this church in northern Iran, or occultation of Mars by the moon, long-term project capturing the motion of planets by my colleague in Turkey, Tunç Tezel, like this view, taking several months to complete and showing how the elongation of Venus is in the sky. Or this one by my colleague in Greece, one Greece member Antonia Iomamitis. It's not the word at night, but we are doing those analemas to complete the educational part of the uh, project. So, a complete year over Greece. And this is the actual image. Wow. There are many analemas on the website. Uh, so, Dyke Alive, this picture is made from Libya a few months before the revolution. Aurora Boralis, of course, the most dramatic scene you can see at night time. Um, each image is only one minute apart, so you can see how dynamic is this phenomenon. Aurora swirls around over Norway. The Earth uh, shadow and what is called the belt of Venus, we can see it every night. Some more atmospheric phenomena like moon halo over this castle in Germany, or a halo around planet Venus in China. Satellites passing by, like here is the ISS space station. Uh, satellites flaring, the radium flares on the right side. And time to time you get mysteries, like this one is a rocketry effect when the rocket is just exhausting the. Uh, Extra fuel is dumping the extra fuel over the Earth's atmosphere. The sunlight is reflected off the cloud and making this uh, strange-looking object in the night sky. Many people might report this as a UFO. Just imagine seeing this in the night sky. Let's see if we can it works. Yeah. Here it comes. So we still don't know which rocket was that. It's captured in very far north Canada. And here are more samples of what could be seen after some rocket revisions, especially when they're failed. <laughs> <laughs> like that one made, made a lot of news. People reported seeing wormholes in the sky. <laughs> And some culture aspects is very important to these images, like this picture of the Southern Cross in Brazil um, is made for the purpose of the Brazilian flag, because the Southern Cross is exactly in, the, in this part of the flag, as well as many other stars. Each year we have an annual um, photo contest, international contest with message of darkest sky preserving, so I highly recommend you to participate if you're doing this or if some of your students are doing this. They're also involved with astrotourism, working with national parks, which are preserving dark skies and doing stargazing programs, like this one in Utah. 
or doing a project called the World's Observatories at the moment documented about 30 observatories around the world and we're going to continue that uh, with other like this one is Mount Kia in Hawaii, the previous one was ESO and the Tuan website is tuanite.org you can either search the images, go to the galleries, submit at the guest gallery or just find images by topical uh, parts of the gallery we have each week we have um, update and uh, the visitors come from all over the world but mostly from North America and Europe but we have some strange visitors from these islands uh, like this one is always active every day we have a visitor from Kerbalan Island which I was at this island uh, in 2003 and uh, I didn't meet that person but met some other um, locals Ah, 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 I still don't know who is visiting one website every day from February. Ah, 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 so ah. thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Baba. Um, we don't have well, we have time for a couple of questions while while Pamela sets up everything here. Pamela, you want to, to? I have to save his first. Ah, okay. So I probably is doing a trick to bring all the virtual presenters. And this is the group photo if you were at the science book. Microphone, microphone, go back. Well, the picture tells. It's the group photo I made at the science cafe. Oh, wow. So I've already shared it with the organizers, so you can get a copy of Or just email me, I can send you. Or go to Facebook, find it there. Uh, hello, that's wonderful images. Do you have anything in the sky? That's really sorry, sorry. Yeah, so we have a couple of articles there, but they're um, not diversity of information for uh, how to start photography. But uh, I can I can uh, write down some very good resources for you. I got, I got that. Well, actually, it's, uh, since 2009, we are he rehearsing how to cooperate and use uh, Tuan images uh, for education. That we need, like the Analema or the, the, the whole. Uh, 
We have Rita is currently waiting. She's going to be the first. I see two men. Can you hear us over there? Uh, yeah, can you okay. hear us? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. You know, we are we not always good women. So very welcome to this conference. And uh, you have uh, people in the audience seeing you. Thank you for agreeing to, to, to participate on this. And uh, Pamela will be helping us here. So Rita is going to talk to us um, about scheduling and reserving website for telescopes. So Rita, we will warn you when you are reaching the 15 minutes. So we still have five minutes for question and answer, OK? Uh, can you repeat, please? We don't uh, hear all. Uh, I just speak it. I will. G I'll give you in the chat a five-minute warning when your time is almost over, and then we'll give you questions from the audience. Did that make sense? Yes. Sir. Okay. Okay. So go ahead and start whenever you want. You're on the big screen, and you look great. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, I am uh, Ju Julien Bichard. Uh, I am a student in uh, SUM in France. And uh, this is uh, Aziz Reda, a student in SUM too. Uh, we work since uh, April on a reservation system for Global HOU for reserving telescope. And uh, we will uh, show you our work. So. Um, this is the main page on uh, the website. So we will, I will show you the reservation system. So I sign in in a manager account, and this is the menu. So you can make reservation here uh, in uh, available reservation. So you choose a telescope, and uh, you you see the whole schedule for this telescope. So this is uh, August. This is for August. So you can see here an open time slot made from the manager of this telescope. You click on it and show time slot for uh, displayed all. Uh, I have a available time slot for this, the ninth. So you can uh, select one or two uh, time slots for make your reservation and book. And now the reservation is made. Uh, you can see the reservation here for my time slot. So uh, actually this is the web stripe running on our computer. We had another one that is online. We use it for uh, the test and something. So this is a enhanced system for the moment. So we also added many ways to do a reservation. So you can see here that there is at least four ways to do a reservation. There is the special reservation. So for a special reservation, you have to select the dates, the hours. Oh, sorry about that. So can you see that there is a kind of security? So, so it said that the time slot is asked. So now if we go to the manager section and manage reservation, we can see that there is a reservation for this one. So the manager has to confirm all the special reservation. So he don't he don't can just give the the time slot all the time. Because if he want to put a time slot, this is quite the same way that the special reservation 
and then it will be displayed like we saw here something in the same order so there is also many access level to the website so we have basic teachers students manager and administrator so manager are basically the people who own telescopes like this this account so as a manager we have many menus so we can add telescopes like this anyway just have to put a name if it's a cute telescope or not the time zone of the telescope so the website take in account that the time zone is not the same between the user and the and the the telescope, so it made the difference and all the hours displayed on the website or at your local hour. So, and you have to, during the sign up, precise the time slots. So, I'm just gonna show you a teacher account. So, this is typically a teacher account. There is a list of students. So, the student who don't have any teacher that said this is my student are all displayed and you just select them and make the change. Now Pelé Jean-Luc is our student and we can active and deactivate his account. So now if you try to look on the website it will ask him to be activated by someone. So this is how we do the the sign up and also when the student try to make a reservation it's not accepted it's not directly sent to the manager it's actually sent to his teacher so now I don't have reservation right now but you have the reservation made by the student and you just have to confirm it so there is a checkbox and you just have to click and save changes um, Let's see the self reservation. So, this is specifically for the teacher because we know that they are looking for the time slots according to the day of the week. So, we can just ask, like, if there is time slot Tuesday, Thursday, no, Friday. Yeah, here it is. So, here is the time slot on Friday. So, you just put the day and then show. And directly on the first page we saw yeah and um, a few minutes ago it was green because we were logged as a manager and we are the one who had the reservation so it was green so it's not green because this is not ours but if we just do that it becomes green so there is also the QA telescope so for the moment the QA telescope just give a description because all the QA telescope have a, a website where you put the, the picture you want so you can just put in the description the URL of the website um, you can also edit the reservation you made so if something went wrong with your reservation you can just delete it, it so the manager will not see it anymore and it will no longer be displayed on the calendar. You can also see all the telescope reservation so for the moment there is only two telescopes um, there is information for the moment there is not all the information we had some um, I give you back Julian and um, we developed two uh, kind of um, uh, uh, system to improve the communication between the user. So you can see all user uh, sign it up in the website, and uh, you can uh, click on someone for see his uh, information. So you can uh, view his name, uh, his number of reservation, his address mail, and his Skype. Uh, and you can send, 
send private message to him so you can uh, add uh, other people and uh, type your message. And uh, this message is uh, sent to the people. And you can see all, uh, it's a um, conversation-based message system. So all system are, all message are displayed in conversation. So you can uh, reply and uh, add a new people in conversation, something like that. So people can communicate in the website. Uh, be, uh, yeah. <coughs> so um, I think we we have finished for the, this presentation. So if you have Let any questions. I'll, I'll see if there's any questions and work on also inviting the next speakers. Okay. Yeah. Julian Reddick. Yeah. Hi, Carl. Hi. So, uh, what? Just they, these two students, very good students, have worked for me. What does this mean, like, if people important? What this means if, if people in Portugal want to use uh, I know or maybe, hopefully Mary Fadavi's telescope in the future or you know, we telescopes on uh, that we have access to the control via ACP or, uh, or mainly ACP. This is a, a clean clean scheduling system, which is quite quite nice and again open to you, everyone in you. So. Can, we're just in the piloting stage right now. I hope, Lech, Lech, I hope we can get it on iNo and Lech can start using it and telling us which, how to improve it. We have about one more month of Reda and Julian. They've done a very nice job. So, uh, and also, you, you'll do a YouTube demo of it too again. The, re the screen resolution was a little bad here, but I think we didn't see all the simplicities of it. But it's a very simple system. With two clicks, and you can get uh, you can get a reservation up there. It may three clicks. Next, you can answer the question: oh, How will this continue after the student enrollment? Uh, I think there's a little bit of promise to maintain it for a while. If I read it, then uh, we'll have to figure out. It might be more as we have more students in school. Thank you guys for waking up early to, to be here talking to us. Thank you very much for the effort of the online screening your presentation. And uh, we hope to see you live next time. We'll be in Portugal in September next year. Hope to see you there live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fabio. Thanks. Bye. Uh, just a second. I need to email a link to Nancy. And I tend to mute things when I type. So just one, one moment, please. Don't worry. Yeah. The presentation will be on the road at the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, Alan will be talking about the NASA Kepler activities and remote astronomy uh, meeting techniques. Except Alan just dropped off. Oh. Alan, if you can hear us, please come back. I've sent invitations to him and to Nancy. We have two more talks for this afternoon. We have Nancy Aliva and Alan Rowe. Let's see who comes up first. So I'll introduce both of them. So that you that you that you know, Matt is uh, also for from the 
uh, and she will be talking about a graph So they are both introduced to you. Let's see what this technology will allow us to do. Who is the winner? <laughs> you get to choose. Uh, the General Assembly is open to anyone willing to participate. Anyone? Be careful. You might, you might get the I could play the videos from Nancy. Um, we also have Luz's presentation. Luz. Luz Angle. It says L U Z. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. There we go. There's somebody. Um, No, that's Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Um, there's, if you're having trouble figuring out your settings, there's a gear in the upper right-hand corner of your screen that will allow you to select your microphone and your video camera. There's also a chat box. I'm going to open up chat, and there's Alan. Okay, Alan. Okay, Alan. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. Welcome to, to Volos. It's uh, good to see you online with us. They already know who you are. So the floor is yours. And uh, you will get a warning when you have five minutes left, okay? Okay. Okay. Uh, Wait a minute, I'm hearing a delay here. Let me. Okay. Can. Am if I connected? You, yes. If you have YouTube open in a different window, YouTube has a several second delay. You need to close every instance of YouTube or a Google event except for this one that's the Hangout page. Okay. I got it. I just closed it. Um, is my lovely face showing up on your screen, too? Yes, we can see you just fine. You have okay. a beautiful face, Alan. <laughs> um, okay, well, uh, greetings from uh, Berkeley, California. And uh, it's really a pleasure to be there uh, in Greece. Um, I'm going to... Let's see, I can do a screen share here, I think. Uh, I'm going to click on my... Yes, to screen share, use the third icon from the top on the left side. It's a monitor, and it glows green when you hover over it. Right, okay, I'm just going to screen share my desktop and see how that works. Um, so, testing out, do you now see a... Um, PowerPoint slide? Yes. Okay, You'll want gonna... to maximize that window. Don't go into play mode. If you go into play mode, we won't see you when you advance the slides. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I'll just make it as big as I can here. Um, so anyway, I've been working on a Kepler mission for a number of years and uh, with the education, public uh, education and public outreach. And uh, those of you who don't know what Kepler mission is, there might be, there might be some, um, it's a mission to find planets around other stars using the transit method, which, uh, which is looking for minuscule drops in brightness uh, of stars. It's looking at about 150,000 stars uh, all at once and continuously. Uh, Lots of planets have been discovered. Well, what I'd like to uh, show you are some of the educational uh, educational uh, uh, activities and things that are, are mostly found on the website. Um, so the first thing that I want you to see is uh, this is this is uh, the exoplanet transit hunt. 
and it's an online simulation uh, where the user or the visitor picks a star from a simulated star field and then goes through a series of screens uh, where they record the brightness of a particular star and that's what this screen is it's the actual data recording screen and uh, and then making measurements from that like uh, can you see my cursor on the screen there yes okay the, in this, this is a really nifty thing where you can actually drag the X scale up to so that the zero point lines up with one of the dips in brightness and it makes it very easy to measure the period of this planet okay and then you would drag you would type that period into a note uh, field down at the bottom that's probably hard to see for you but uh, there's a place to put notes about the type of star and and the measurements that you're making and then in the next screen in the subsequent screens you use that data to do calculations to determine how big the planet is how far it is from its star using Kepler's third law and uh, and the estimated uh, temperature of the planet um, so this is a nifty uh, uh, online tool that it's good to use the next thing I'd like to show or talk about is a is a model of the of a system. Uh, this blue thing here is a orrery, which is a model. It, in this, or, the original name for orrery came from uh, the Duke of Orrery in England, who made a model of the solar or had a model of the solar system made. Um, this though is a model with a light for a star and two planets that you can turn with a hand crank and and there's a, um, a, a little stand here for a light sensor to sit on uh, this is this is a commercially available unit uh, and the light you have to supply your own light sensor actually um, so but actually there's a, uh, a a free software that we've developed which turns your laptop into a light that's sort of a light sensor it's not doesn't have a great doesn't have scientific accuracy to it but it's this is a a model to show how things work Alan I'm so, going to interrupt you for a moment you have growl turned on and we can see when you get mail notifications you might want to close your mail okay let me show you all my mail. And I'll quit. Um, okay. Did you get all that mail? Yep. Privacy completely gone. Okay. Um, but anyway, that that light sensor then can be directed at this light, and it produces a light curve like you see over here. Uh, and I I was watching. Uh, I was able to hear some of the earlier presentations, and there was some some uh, good things said about using light curves in classes and so this is a, this is another example of that and in fact um, the next the next uh, feature that I'd like to show is is a classroom activity which is called transit tracks um, all these things are on the Kepler website by the way if the URL of this particular one is up here uh, but if you just go to kepler.nasa.gov and look under the education section, you'll you'll be able to find many many good tools, uh, teaching tools. Uh, but in this particular activity, the students find out about what a transit is, and and they and they learn or they describe about how a planet's size or its distance from a star would affect the behavior of the transits or the shape of the light curve. Um, so then they dive into this to do some analysis like, uh, pretty much like the uh, online interactive of um, the Kepler exoplanet transit hunt that I first talked about. and. Uh, but in this case it's a classroom activity where they use hard copy light curves like you see here and they do the similar kinds of analysis 
Um, another neat activity is the human-powered orrery, which is a great, a great model. This is a kinesthetic model where you lay out circles um, on the ground, and we found out that the inner solar system fits to scale in a classroom if you have the sun about about one centimeter in size. Um, but this is a three-dimensional model because there's two dimensions to put the orbits in, and then the third dimension is time to show the planets moving. So students will go in and and step out, and the you know four four volunteers will come in and do this at various times, and then the rest of the class will direct them to take steps. Each of these pieces of tape that are on these circles. Uh, represents two weeks of time. So the class will clap or and say two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, and that, that directs the volunteer to take these steps and it soon becomes apparent the relative speeds of the planets. It's, it's, a, it's a fun activity and it illustrates Kepler's law in a non-mathematical way. Um, Kepler's third law, I should say. Um, so that's a, that's a, from a GEMS, uh, Great Explorations in Math and Science uh, activity that was published in 2008. Of course, I can't go with this presentation without mentioning the Kepler star wheels, which is based on Uncle Al's star wheels. Um, but for Kepler, we made it so that you can see the actual place in the sky where Kepler is pointing. Um, and by the way, unfortunately, in case you hadn't heard, Kepler, Kepler is down one too many reaction wheels. It was equipped with four reaction wheels for precisely pointing the telescope. And one of them failed last year, and a second one failed this year. Un unfortunately, it needs three to actually point accurately. So it... Tests are being done now to see if they can be resurrected, one of them. Uh, but it doesn't look too hopeful. So we're going to have to go with the data that we've already gotten, which is voluminous. There's a huge amount of data. But anyway, that's where the telescope is pointing in the sky, in the Cygnus Lyra area. Um, these green circles each mark a naked eye star brighter than magnitude 5 that is known to have one or more exoplanets. Um, so there's actually two wheels that can slip in and out of this. This is, shows the night sky at any time of day or night. I, I, I bet, I think most of you are familiar with how a planisphere works. Um, but one of the wheels, not the one shown here, but another wheel you can slip in has RA and deck coordinate grid on it. So you can plot other things on it like new planets that are discovered or things in our solar system that move that are interesting like comets like the big comet that's coming up in the fall you could plot on here um, or or even planet even the planets in our solar system you could plot the positions for the current year or current month or whatever there is a set of questions that are in um, an investigation called using star maps, which is from our Hands-On Universe book, The Changing Cosmos. So um, the last thing I want to talk about is uh, briefly, in our extended mission, we are planning on making an online workshop for teachers that shows these things and how to use them, and maybe some other things too. Um, but we're going to use some techniques that we learned about in a um, another project that is a NASA project but uh, from the Earth the Earth uh, Science Division which was a high school um, lifelines for high school climate change education and there we were trying to make professional learning communities of teachers to share ideas about teaching climate change but also, in the process, identify some of the best strategies for distance meetings. 
and uh, I won't go into detail on that. If you if you go to the um, Global System Science website, uh, which let's see if I let me let me just flash it on here. There's a I think I had it here. This is what the Global System Science website looks like. There's a Lifelines page which has the final report of our findings on setting up these online communities, which which would be useful in setting up communities of teachers for astronomy, which uh, Global Hands-On Universe seems to have an interest in and uh, and actually has actively pursued and is successful in many ways as evidence from this conference. Um, I wanted to mention one thing though that is not in the uh, in the report or not in my paper actually that's for this conference I, I neglected to put it in but something that we learned very early on in the lifelines project is that you always want to test out your meeting system the platform with uh, any new especially with any new people who are coming into the group to make sure that it works for them and because uh, otherwise it's destined for failure um, or there's a high likelihood of failure. So um, that's something that whenever possible should be done before a meeting actually happens. Um, make Alan, sure everybody... you're running out of time. Okay, well, um, that's good because that was my last slide except for this one which shows that um, the Kepler website, the Global System Science website, and my email. And I wish I could be there in person uh, so that I could ask you more questions. Actually, I am more or less in person, and I did ask you some questions. But if you have more questions now, and if there's any time, you can ask me or send me, uh, send me things in email. Okay, thanks for having me. Thank you, Alan. There are questions. Hi, Alan. Carl. Can you hear okay, Alan? Hello, Alan. I hear I think I hear Carl. Yeah. All right. Hi, um, is there any hope of getting access to the data from the stars for students to look for variable stars? It's already for variable stars, uh, yes. Actually, there's a there's a teacher in. Actually, there's a professor who is at uh, South Carolina State University who contacted us. She's doing some Kepler uh, work on on uh, data from the Kepler, you know, data that's already collected from Kepler, and she's coming up with some uh, interesting activities and access to the Kepler data, easy access to the Kepler data, specifically for variable stars, different types of variable stars. So we're working on a, an actual activity for that, as well as tools for accessing the Kepler data, uh, you know, where you don't have to be an, uh, an astronomer scientist to actually access it. More questions for Alan? You can switch to your camera, Alan. Uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'll do that. Uh, seems that there's no more questions, Alan. I would just like to warn you that uh, we are back with you at 7, 7 p.m. Greek time uh, for the General Assembly. Uh, okay? An hour and 15 minutes from now. Okay. Okay, All thank right. you. All right, thank you, Juan. Thank you very much. So we now will switch to Nancy Abima. Hello, everyone. Just a second, Nancy. Let me introduce you again so that sure. everyone uh, remembers you. Um, so Nancy is uh, from the University of California. He's going to talk to talk about across time and space, creating a community of practice for teachers using virtual tools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nancy, for agreeing to participate virtually.
Well, thank you both. Thank you, Rosa. Um, so, as Rosa mentioned, my name is Nancy, Nancy Alley, from, uh, and I'm here in, in Berkeley, California. I'd love to be there with you all in, in Greece, but uh, unfortunately, circumstances didn't permit this time. Um, and this is my first time using Google Plus Hangout, so um, I'm hoping everything will go smoothly with it. I'm sure it will. Um, so basically, I'm here today to talk about a initiative that is coming out of NASA-funded uh, programs, mission teacher development programs, uh, called Community of Practice. <clears throat> and this is something that developed out of um, the heliophysics division of NASA. Um, many of you may know that various different NASA missions have different uh, teacher professional development programs such as workshops, um, conferences, train the trainer programs, that sort of thing. And uh, what we were hearing back from many of the teachers is that they would go to these experiences and, and learn lots of new content and, and resources and then go back into their classrooms and, and implement. And uh, in many situations, they're the only teacher in their school who has had this experience with the professional development. And heliophysics is somewhat of a... Um, an unusual content to incorporate into, into existing curricula. Um, so we heard back from teachers that they really needed some extra support beyond these workshops that they went to, some ongoing support in terms of being able to connect up with other teachers who had also had those same experiences and also being able to connect up with the scientists to be able to ask questions and learn more about the, the topic and the mission um, and you know just to have that sense of community. So what we did, um, the, Themis, the Themis mission education public outreach in coordination with the Van Allen probes mission uh, education public outreach and also the the NASA Science Mission Directorate Heliophysics Forum uh, initiated this community of practice for middle and high school science teachers across the United States. And all of the best practices research about community of practice indicates that it's really important that the shape of the community is developed by the members themselves in this case, the, the teachers. So we approached 12 uh, teachers who had attended various different NASA-funded programs and asked them to act as lead teachers for the community of practice uh, and commit to nine months from January 2013 through September. And these teachers, we, in, in order to, to be the lead teacher, um, the idea is that they would learn about what a community of practice is and make recommendations and shape the development of this uh, so that it could then be opened up to uh, really all, um, all teachers who attend NASA heliophysics professional development and, in fact, really any teacher who, who was interested with a focus on middle and high school science teachers. Uh, and these lead teachers come from all over the United States, uh, geographic distribution from Hawaii to Puerto Rico, over six different, different time zones. And uh, they also receive honoraria for their, their participation and the time that they spend working on this. So we started off in January of 2013 doing uh, teleconferences every month. And that was a good start, but it quickly became apparent that we, we needed more interaction beyond these teleconferences. So we set up a um, group on Wigio, which stands for Working in Groups. And I'm going to try and um, share my screen to show you the 
Wigio uh, the Wigio website. So let's try let me try this and see if this works. Um, and if for some reason this doesn't come through, then you can also um, I, I had submitted a paper and there's a small screenshot in there of Wigio. Um, can you see this Wigio right now? Very badly. Very badly. Okay. Our projector is low resolution, so we only have an 800 pixel wide screen. I see. Okay. Well, it, I'll just give you some general overview of it. Um, and then if anyone has additional questions, I'm happy to, uh, to talk with you offline over email about it. But the general idea of Wikio is that it, it's got many different features to it. The, the feed section is the discussion, acts as the discussion board. And um, you can see that there's different uh, conversations going on here, sharing links and resources. And the nice thing about this is that it gets uh, the individual participant can choose to have it delivered, the conversations delivered directly to your email. So you don't have to log in to the website in order to see it. You can uh, interact solely through email. Uh, so there's a discussion board feature, folders where we have been gathering different resources as well as um, meeting notes and that sort of thing. Documents, so this is a place where you can upload documents, uh, you can upload links, you can also share, initiate documents such as Excel, spreadsheets, and Word and automatically save it and others can edit it on, online and a calendar feature as well. And so uh, this basically, it, once we started using Wigio, um, we noticed that there was a, a change in the dynamics of the, the group of the lead teachers because there was a lot more interaction between them and it really started to create, create a sense of community that this was a shared space that everybody can contribute to. So, the original plan was to have to bring all of the teachers together uh, in Berkeley, um, California, in June for a two-day retreat where we would all meet together in person and um, spend some real quality time discussing what the community is, how to grow it, um, that sort of thing. And, and I'm sure. I think you can all recognize that being able to be in person, such as you are in Greece right now, is really invaluable to be able to have those more informal times to, you know, spend some time eating together, touch, casually talking. It just really is the ideal situation. Um, and actually, I think that that would have been the perfect, the ideal situation would have been to have this in-person meeting at the very beginning of the community of practice. Um, but we were working with teachers who, of course, teach, and uh, in the United States, at least, they typically don't get their, so their break until um, the summer, so we waited until June. Now, unfortunately, um, it turned out that there were some travel restriction questions coming out of NASA, um, questions about ongoing funding that, at the time, it was unclear to us whether or not we we could hold the in-person workshop, so uh, we elected to have a virtual retreat instead, rather than bringing all of the teachers here and, we, and, and it might not have been possible to reimburse them for travel funds and that sort of thing. So we had a virtual retreat and of course we, in, in that sense we needed some sort of a, a virtual tool um, and we used what's called Zoom. And I'm going to share my screen again to show you. This is a screenshot of the. Uh, this is a screenshot of of Zoom during the virtual retreat. And Zoom is a video conferencing uh, program 
it's uh, Wigio. I don't think I mentioned is a free program, um, and Zoom as well is a free program up to, but as long as your meetings are up to 40 minutes long. If you want longer than 40 minutes, then there's a paid version, or you can just keep starting new meetings for 40 minutes. But the idea here is that each participant joined in um, from their own home, which was a little challenging because, as I mentioned, we were crossing six different time zones. So in order to find a time that everybody could get together, uh, we had to really do some careful scheduling. And um, what we ended up doing was having uh, structuring the two days so that there were different types of sessions, a full group session where everyone came together, and this screenshot is from one of those sessions. Uh, in this case, on the right hand side, you can see um, this is Laura Petacolis from the Space Sciences Lab, who is uh, teaching the teachers about magnetism, and she's holding up a compass. Um, and then on the left side of the screen, you can see the various different teachers who were involved. Um, there's also a chat feature where people can chat with each other in the back, the back chat of the, the, the session. Um, so there were full group sessions that involved scientists, teachers, NASA coordinators. There were also breakout sessions throughout the day where smaller groups of teachers would get together uh, in their own Zoom meetings to discuss, uh, to have discussions and share resources. And then there was also time built in for individual assignments and reflections that each teacher did on, on their own time, so to speak, and then would bring back to the group. So the evaluations for this virtual retreat um, indicated that it was actually a huge success. Uh, I think a lot of us were a little, it was the first time all of us had done this type of thing um, in the community of practice. And many people were concerned about, uh, you know, whether or not it would really give the same sense of being in person. Um, whether it would be exhausting to sit in front of your computer for two days, to doing video conferencing. Um, so I would say that, that a lot of the teachers went into it with some trepidation. Uh, and the evaluation results came back with incredibly positive comments saying that, that it, the experience went far beyond their expectations. So that was nice to get back. Um, now, that was back in June, and since then we have continued with our monthly, in the, now we're using Zoom, monthly video conferences. Um, we had a scientist from the Van Allen Probes mission give an update on that mission. And as we're moving towards the end of the lead teacher's tenure it, that we had asked them to commit to, we're starting to have discussions about, okay, so now we've created this community of practice, these lead teachers have had the experience of it and created a, a solid um, base for it, and now we're starting to talk about what next, where do we go from here? because the intent is, has always been to expand it out to a wider variety of teachers um, with the lead teachers remaining the kind of core group who guides the development of it and the leadership of it. Um, but we really want to do this quite mindfully because as we grow the community, there, we want to make sure that it continues to be successful. So that's where we're headed with it, is starting to talk about where, how, to, how to expand it out. Um, and as well, we have our evaluator on the project, Cornerstone Evaluation, is going to be evaluating the lead teacher's experience over their nine-month period. So that's coming up as well. Um, so I'm going to stop here, and um, if there are any questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. Um, I had also uh, submitted a paper for this, so that provides a few more details, as well as my contact information, if you would like to follow up with me. 
And I see Pamela put in the chat window, please explain NASA forums and directorate. Um, so basically the NASA forum, um, there are different, there are four different divisions in NASA based on content, astrophysics, heliophysics, planetary science, and earth science. And um, each of those divisions has education and public outreach activities that they do. Um, and the, each, each division has a, what's called a forum, which coordinates the, those activities and provides resources and um, basically acts as a, um, um, as a conduit for the pro, for passing along information from NASA headquarters to the people who are implementing the education public outreach. Thank you very much. Last year, Nima was really good uh, presentation. Without more point, you dazzled us with your explanations of the title, the complexity, and you won't see the, the world of communication and expanding. I keep every time I meet you, I find a new resource I would like to use last time. In the archive, it was the Worldwide Telescope. It's very successful now in our training, so now I have to learn how to use this new tool that you're sharing with us. So, Thank you, Rosa. No questions, Carol? <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you again. Thank you. Let's thank all the, the speakers from this uh, afternoon. Well, we, we continue here. Did I forget anything? No?